everybody. Welcome. I'm Carolyn McGrath, and I'm one of the organizers of Hopo Valley Green Week. We're in our third full year of Green Week programming, which is pretty amazing. Um, we sort of started off in um, this is the third year. Yeah. So, um, and as I was saying before, we started almost exclusively with Zoom events and now we're mostly doing in-person events, which are wonderful. Um, and I want to thank um, our speakers who are here this evening. And I'm just going to introduce everybody. And then we're going to watch uh, a short film that's kind of going to give us a little background on our topic this evening. So our topic is food farming and justice. So. Let me just start us off with our intros. And this evening, I will start off with introducing Renata Barnes. So Renata is the coordinator of the Outdoor Equity Alliance, an organization whose mission is to create and implement attractive, accessible, and equitable educational and academic experiences and career opportunities for people of all ages, races, and ethnicities, income levels and abilities, with a focus on people of color and other marginalized communities to enjoy nature and become stewards of the outdoors and provide an avenue for deeper engagement in the environmental sector. That was mouthful. <laughs> it's a lot of good stuff in there. So Renata is a native New Yorker who was raised in Hopal Valley and returned here after working in the film and television industry in New York for two decades. Renata is the co-founder of Hopal Valley Race and Diversity, which is now called Hopal Valley Together. She has long been passionate about issues of racial equity, equality, and justice. So everybody welcome Renata. Our next uh, guest that we have here this evening is um, Tamia McQueen. And Tamia is an educator, a farmer, and a master gardener who is specializing in edible gardens. She is the owner of Wild, Wildflower Farm and the founder of Dance for Life, Love, Inspiration, Faith, and Empowerment, and Gardening for Life. Tamiya has been an educator for 18 years, an edible gardens consultant for 15 years, and in dance ministry for 13 years. Tamiya has, is also a board member of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, New Jersey, and Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space, and a member of the governance of the Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance, where she also co-led for the value added working group. She continues to work as an educator and choreographer in the community. So welcome to Mia. Yay. <laughs> um, so we have the um, wonderful uh, luck this evening that we have two Central High School students um, who are going to be leading this conversation and um, I'm gonna take a back seat, which is what I prefer. <laughs> um, so I wanna just to introduce those students and I also wanna really thank them for coming out and for guiding this conversation because um, so much of what we do as educators is, is for the next generation and and we hope that, that you will take up the um, take up the cause that that we're talking about tonight and and progress even further. So um, Sarah, Sarah Rodriguez is here with us tonight. And Sarah has been interested in the agricultural field for a few years now. And having members of her family that were once farmers helps connect her to her roots and causes her to further value this field as a whole. She is currently working as an intern in the AgriHood program, and she appreciates this opportunity um, that the AgriHood program has given her to get 
Hien Sa'an experience with farming and gardening and to encourage her to pursue a career in permaculture or agriculture in the future. So welcome to Sarah. Yay. And my last introduction is Xavier Fields, who I know from teaching in my ceramics class, um, also a fantastic artist. Um, Xavier enjoys farming and the science of ecosystems. He is majoring in botany and hopes to become some sort of farmer in the future. He also happens to be a member of the Black Student Union at Hopewell Valley Central High School because he enjoys supporting other Black students at Hopewell. So oh, we have an extra guest. So yay, Xavier! <laughs> So I'm thrilled to have everybody um, here and to get this conversation started. So I still, just to kind of get things rolling, I selected a video that gives a little bit of a historic overview and also brings us into the present. So it's not a short film. It's, I don't know, I think it's maybe eight or 10 minutes long, if even. And after the film, We'll have the opportunity to discuss it and to talk about um, what the students are doing, what Tami is doing, what Renat is doing, and really to just hear all of the amazing work that's going on right here in Hopeful Valley. So let's get started. And I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone hear that? A farm is, you know, a Black person will think of slavery. There's really no way that your ancestors can go through hundreds of years of enslavement and tenant farming and being ripped off their land by racist violence and not have this visceral reaction to the earth because the land really was the scene of the crime. Yeah. We had these autonomous, beautiful relationships with land before, and that's something we can reclaim and get connected to. Uh, uh, Black farmers have historically been missing from narratives about farm life. There ain't nobody gonna push me off my land. From Hollywood films. If you build it. The PSAs in the 2000s. Farmers were our foundation. They're the ones who made us strong. But black farmers have always been here. In spite of the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule, black farmers made up a sizable 14% of the farming population in the 1920s. Fast forward to the 80s, when they were said to be on the brink of extinction. Then in 2012, the agriculture census showed a rise in Black farmers. But a new food economy investigation earlier this year disputed the increase, saying it reflected changes in methodology, not reality. One thing is certain, there's been a rapid decline in the number of Black farmers over the past century. And there's no shortage of reasons why widespread USDA discrimination against Black farmers who needed loans and assistance, as well as Black land taken or lost through force, local corruption, and fractured land titles all played a role. Now, with the case for reparations gaining traction in Congress and among Democratic presidential candidates, the history of Black farmers and land loss is receiving new interest. Um, come on, kiddies. You all want The family of Ernest Fine a retired auto mechanic and former farmer, is among the many Black families in the rural South who have lost land. This house right here, this was my great granddaddy, his wife. This where I was born in. I was born right, right there. I was born in 47, 1947. In the early 1900s, the Vines family purchased roughly 50 acres of land. This deal was made on the 5th day of February, 1906. Off the vine with my granddaddy. They approached this land from the Dawson, and they, and they approached it for $750. They first started losing property in the late 1930s, when a white neighbor claimed 14 acres of their land. Vines' father tried to fight it. This is my father right here. And everybody say he favored me. Well, I know my father started going back to court in the, in the 30s. The father of the land had been you know, taken away from it. And so, my oldest brother, he would tell me my father would go up to the courthouse and come back with tears in his eyes, saying what people done done and how they could do things, how they could, could do things and get away with it. And he died unhappy with a heart attack. And I believe that's what really put a lot of stress on 
Over the span of 70 years, both him and his father dealt with land disputes that cost the family half their property. He went to over here, and you're not the only one in this area that happened to him. A lot of people can hear this to tell this. People might not think this is not real, but it is, it is, it is real. It was a colorful thing. And that's why a lot of them, black farmers couldn't make it. And that's why a lot of them left and went, went to the city because it was, was not fair with them, what they were trying to do. Unable to get a farmer's loan and keep up with court fees, Vines took a step back from farming in the early 1980s. Several years ago, him and his wife found a way to keep the land in use. We donated to the church and they training young generation how to farm and how to grow different things. I thank God that I fight it. And they let my father, they let my mother, they let nobody down, they let God down. I think I did enough out here. So that's a, that's a younger generation, younger crowd going and do what I used to try to do. Yeah. The average age of American farmers is rising. But some black farming organizations are seeing a new generation of growers emerge. 26 year old Kendrick Ransom is one of them. He runs an organic vegetable farm on family land, less than 15 miles from the Vines property. I don't know many black farmers around here, especially not young farmers. I do have a couple elder farmers that come out to the farm and help me give me some tips every now and then. Back in 1925, Black farmers in Edgecombe County outnumbered white farmers. But by 2017, the number of black farmers dropped by 99%. Where y'all at? Ready for breakfast. When people think of a farmer, I believe they think of a poor peasant, you know, someone that's uneducated, just of the land, you know, just likes to get dirty. I don't really think people really grasp the significance of farming and the, the, uh, the role of the farmer. What's up, you sleep good? I got into a bunch of trouble when I was younger and I started driving dump trucks and I started breeding dogs and then later on became uh, the agriculture piece. That was more so like an awakening for me, you know, it was more so of a calling. I got a lot of weird reactions. Folks just couldn't wrap their minds around it and it was just like farming. This guy wants to be a farmer? He was in the bathroom, baby. What's taking y'all so long? Come on. Yeah, it was very, very challenging times when we when we first got going out here. Come on, push the wagon. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Didn't really have much to work with. Had nothing at all, really. We got hoes, shovels, rakes. So that's pretty much it. Hey, you take it too long. Oh, you did. It's very important that we learn how to survive and learn how to make use of what we got. Instead of just waiting around for grants or somebody to donate me or waiting on a handout, we make it work. I've never thought about taking out a loan. That's just something that I've been taught. <laughs> My big brother told me to stay away from loans. I'm familiar with the issues that Black farmers face when they did take out loans and they were unable to pay them back. You know, you lose everything you got, and that's including your farm and your land for your family. Thank you for this land. Thank you for this land. This healing, this healing, this healing land. This healing, this healing, this healing land. Yeah, yeah, go away. Go away. I am the granddaughter of Brownie Lee McCullough, who was displaced from her land in Rock Hill, South Carolina, as a child of the Great Migration. I am the granddaughter of Samuel Cornelius Smith, who was displaced from his land, fleeing from abuses of government in IEC, and was fortunate enough to be the first returning generation of the grandchildren to find land again. Over a decade ago, Leah Penniman and her husband bought 72 acres in rural Grafton to start Soul Fire Farm, a community and teaching farm. While some folks will call it Trump country, this is actually Mohican country. This is native territory, and it also has a long history being Black land as well. 
Harriet Tubman built her farm not too far from here, as well as the Timbuktu Black community and Rap Road Black community. So it's not that we don't belong here, but we are definitely reclaiming space after many generations of being forced off of this land. Last year, more than a thousand urban and rural growers of color attended workshops at Soulfire on everything from organic gardening to food justice. Soulfire also launched what it calls a reparations map, where people with the means can locate farmers of color to donate to. The reparations map is a people to people land and resource redistribution project that matches up black and brown farmers to folks with privilege who want to support their project. One, two, three, four, five. 15. Okay, so we have um, currently around 70 entries into the reparations map. We do a lot of uprooting racism trainings for white led organizations and in white spaces, and the reparations map is one of those what you can do kind of things that uh, most people have the ability to engage with at least at some level. These projects have received anything from, you know, a few thousand dollars to an entire parcel of land for their projects so that they could go forward with their plans to feed the community. We're situating it as a remedy, one remedy to the long legacy of land theft and dispossession. I think when you frame it as charity or a fund, you're leaning into this idea of the worthy and benevolent donor doing the right thing for the community. But this is really about justice and fairness and correcting a past harm. Thanks so much for sharing that to me. So I wanted to, um, I thought the, the, the short film did a good job of kind of giving an overview and, and kind of situating us and where we are today. So from here, I wanted to turn the conversation over to Sarah and Xavier and they'll take it from here. Hi, I, I guess we'll take it from here. Um, so we we're just here to basically ask questions uh, and we have questions. <laughs> so um, Ms. Barnes, can you um, describe the Outdoor Equity Alliance program and the Agrihood program for you know those who don't exactly know what it is? Sure, no worries. You can call me Renata. Um, Wow, so the Outdoor Equity Alliance, uh, this is an organization um, that uh, started um, with some folks at Frovos, uh, Lisa Wolf and um, uh, Aaron Watson of the, the Mercer County Park Commission. Uh, so they started this, I, I believe in 2019, uh, and um, yeah, and then, 20, and then 2020, and then of course we know COVID hit. Um, so we've got a three-pronged mission. The first one is to make sure that the outdoors are welcoming to everybody. Um, our parks, preserves, open spaces, and trails, um, that everybody feels welcome, uh, and especially uh, for people uh, in emerging communities. And that is a term that you guys will hear me use. An emerging community, those are the people, communities, or people groups that have historically been on, have been disenfranchised from the land, uh, socially, economically, vocationally, and accessibility, accessibly, accessibly. Uh, secondly, we work to reach communities and encourage um, encourage the the conviction of uh, stewardship, caring for the environment. It's the one entity that we all share. Uh, we all benefit from it. And if COVID taught us anything, um, when nature yells back at us, it makes all of us stop. We need to take better care of ourselves uh, and especially the environment. We want to create a sense of preservation there. 
Thirdly, um, we want to create avenues and pathways to education, vocation, um, internships, uh, both for students and other people, those who are re formerly incarcerated, those who are re-entering um, uh, society, those who are re entering a new, uh, another phase of their life and want to do something else. Uh, we want to provide opportunities for that, whether it's college or it's an apprenticeship. Uh, and we expressly want to make sure that we are aiding the mission of diversifying the environmental sector. Um, I don't have to tell anybody, it is one of the last bastions of whiteness. And uh, if we are going to be dealing with the environmental issues and struggles and challenges we have, uh, it is really important for everybody's needs to be under the table. Uh, and the OEA, we take it very seriously that we make sure everyone can be there. So that's kind of what we do uh, in, in a nutshell, broadly speaking. Oh, you want to hear about the agrihood? Yeah, that's okay. it. <laughs> agrihood, real short. Um, this is our second year of doing our agrihood internship. And um, it is just an amazing program. You saw in the video that we just saw Leah Pennyman. And uh, Leah, we actually used her book last year, which is, I don't know if you can see this, Farming While Black. That was our text last year for, um, and all, this, all of the interns um, got a copy of that. Um, we wanna re, we wanna introduce people to agriculture in a way that they haven't before. And for many people, the first time. Uh, they've really encountered agriculture. So we made a point to cast a wide net. We bring, um, we bring kids uh, and interns from all over Mercer County. Uh, like, again, we had 20 spots, just like we have this year. Last year, we had to choose um, 20 interns out of over 70. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's, it's quite a feat because I interview every one of them, every one of them I interview. Um, and we've got a great crop this year. We want to uh, introduce people to uh, the people who farm, where your food comes from, um, why it is important to, um, to take care of the environment. We're trying to show the connectivity between who we are, what we eat, and who produces our food. Um, farmer Tamia was one of our farmers last year. Uh, we have Rob Flory from... Um, a How Living Farm. We have Tyrell Smith from the Smith Family um, Foundation. Um, gosh, Matt Conver, uh, Capital City Farms, How Living Farms, Wildflower Farm. Oh my gosh, so many great places who have really availed themselves to teaching young people um, about farming, about the truth of it, the history of it, the inequities in it, why it matters. Um, so last year was kind of an intro. This year we're focusing on food systems uh, and that's a big one. So one of the big issues that we are talking about this year is getting um, getting the, the interns used to hearing about the inequities in the food system, um, the reality that whoever controls what you eat controls you. Um, issues like waste, waste is huge. Um, how we can stratify society by what people eat. There are certain foods that we can get in Hopewell and Pennington and Titusville that you can't get readily in Ewing and Trenton. Why is that? Why is there such a distance, a distance between what we eat and who makes it? And this is why, I mean, I know if you guys have not heard me talk about to me as far, you guys know I'm her hype woman. So I always go before, before her and say, that's where you need to shop. You need to, we've got so many great farmers, big farmers, small farmers, um, people who are really committed to feeding the community. Um, I think we'll find out that we eat too much, we waste way too much, and um, trying to answer the question, I think one of the questions I'd ask the interns at this year's orientation is, um, why do we waste? Do you remember that, Sarah? Why, why do we waste? 
and people had a bunch of answers. Well, I'll tell you, it's because we can. And that's all I'll say. Thanks. I just had a few questions for Tamia as well. Um, how did you um, get into farming and how would you describe your job at Wildflower Farm? Oh, goodness. So um, I got into farming um, by following a rabbit hole. <laughs> so uh, the short version is that I have scarring alopecia. And after about 10 or 15 years suffering with it, I did a YouTube video. I'm just trying to help you know, other people that might be suffering with it. Um, that video blew up on me a little bit uh, and ended up with something like 700,000 views or something crazy like that. But it was the comment section that really pushed me. I was already a beginning gardener, but it was the comment section that really started having a conversation about nutrition that sent me down the rabbit hole of uh, food. And so that's when I really want started wanting to grow the food that my family ate. Um, and it stopped being so much as trying to figure out the cure that the doctors didn't understand and more so about wanting to ensure that the, the food that we fed our family was as healthy as it could possibly be. Um, even then I was a gardener, I, I had not intended on farming. Um, and when we decided to leave the suburbs, my husband basically said city or country. And when he said city, he meant Manhattan, which is where we met. Um, and I opted for country, you know, I, we had kind of decided we didn't want to be in the typical Midwest suburban bubble anymore. Um, mostly for the sake of our kids having other opportunities in terms of schools and also having other life experiences. You know, we, we traveled quite a lot to get them to accustomed to being around lots of different people. And we decided we wanted to live in an environment where there were lots of different other people instead of having to travel overseas or travel somewhere else. We wanted to be closer to communities that had more diversity. Uh, that was very important to us. We actually moved to our farm. We found our farm by accident. We actually were looking at a place across the road um, our last day on the East Coast, uh, last house, and we we came out, we knew that wasn't for us, and there was a sign across the street. And uh, um, unlike me, my husband decided, well, let's knock on the door, which is <laughs> being from Detroit, that's not something I would do. Um, but he decided, well, we'll just go knock and ask, uh, because the real estate agent didn't know anything about the property. And that was really the, the end of the, you know, or I should say the beginning of an entirely uh, new journey. So the farm, you know, we didn't go, we actually opened commercially a month before COVID hit. So that was entertaining. Um, well, not really, but it was a journey. Um, and we are, everything is organically raised, soy free. And we try to be as sustainable as possible, meaning that all of the breeds with the exception of our broilers, all of the breeds that we have on our farm of our animals are breeds that are known to raise their own young, which many people don't know a lot. You know, most of the commercial breeds cannot and do not. Um, we are focused on conservation and agriculture and trying to show people that not only um, can it be done, but it should be done. Quite often there's a divide between agriculture and conservation um, that doesn't need to be there and shouldn't be there in terms of sustainability. Um, having lots of space where people can walk around and people are hungry, kind of, that's a problem. And yet tearing up all of your wild areas in order to have monoculture crops is also a problem. So we're hoping that we're a 42 acre farm. Uh, we're about 20 acres of woodland, 20 acres of crop and pasture uh, space. And we hope that over time, we'll be able to show people how you can use your land in a regenerative way and in a, a way that is in line with both teaching people to feed themselves and also conserving your space. So for instance, we run our chickens, our pastures have never had seed on them. They were very depleted when we got here because they, uh, the people who lived here before had retired and allowed a farmer to use that land. And so they were doing corn and soy and wheat and all of the other depletive um, monoculture crops. And what we did is we started running our birds down those fields. 
And the greenest pasture is the one that they were on the longest. And then the one after that is the one they're currently on. And so using those methods rather than chemical fertilizers is a very powerful, very useful. And we still have our meat. We still have, can sell those, those animals and, and all of the other things that go with that. We, uh, we are aiming for zero waste. We're not there yet. Um, and so even in our processing, we use as much as possible that goes back to the gardens or goes to the fruit trees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are also, so we do organic soy-free uh, poultry, uh, grass-fed lamb, and our organically raised vegetables. We are not certified yet, but we're hoping to get there, uh, ideally this year. Um, and we also are seed grower uh, for both Ujama Seeds and uh, another seed company as well. And we focus on culturally significant seed and crops. So, um, you know, we do things like, for instance, that you, there are many things that we can't, you know, as Renata mentioned, can't find in our grocery stores. People who traditionally eat certain things, for instance, I can't find, you know, turnip greens, right? And there are people who can't, we were talking about the scotch bonnet peppers that are harder to find. And so there's a group of us that have gotten together and decided we're going to grow them ourselves for our families. Um, and so that kind of, you know, that seed growing has ex extended into a gardening club that brings community and, and, and a culture of being amongst each other and growing food that we, our families traditionally enjoy eating. Um, and so the other thing that I would say about the farm is that we have what I I'm a little strange. I'm I'm told I've been told by farmers it's not a great business policy, but I we have two humane policies. So we have our purple banding policy, uh, which simply means that an animal, if it's purple banded, is never processed and never sold for whatever reason. They might be an excellent mother, an excellent, you know, papa roo or whatever have you. Uh, we don't clip wings, we don't clip beaks, we don't tr um, trim claws. We if an animal um, has one bad day. Our one bad day policy means that we hope to only have our animals have one bad day. That's the day that they leave or the day that they're processed. So if we have an animal that's attacked, for example, we have predation issues because we free range, then if it survives with care from us, it's never processed and never sold as purple bandit. And if we can't maintain it on the property, it's, it's taken to a sanctuary. We don't do double jeopardy. We don't help it get better and then turn around and process it. Uh, again, I've been told that's bad business, but that's my philosophy in terms of balancing the fact that we eat meat. Um, and I tell people, you know, if you're going to eat it, you really should see it be done or partake in doing it at least once in your life. And nine times out of 10, you'll, you'll get there where you're not eating as much. You're not wasting as much. You'll have more respect for what it is you're actually doing. Um, but other than that, we do educational classes on self-sustainability and, and community sustainability. And we focus on teaching people how to feed themselves. You know, my told our children, you know, if you never want to look at another chicken, you would never want to plant another seed, that's fine. But you will know how to, how to feed yourself by the time you leave home. So that if you need or want to, you can. So that I would say that's the biggest thing is I, I ask students when they come, if you cannot feed yourself, are you really free? And it's really a rhetorical question. So that's the very long, short version. All right, so I just had like a, a general question for both of you. So for the video that we watched, um, can either of you in any way like relate to that video at all? Does it evoke any feelings that you felt or anything that like you can relate to specifically in your respective fields. Our, our respective fields. Was that a pun? I don't. I don't know. Was that a pun? <laughs> Just, um, oh my gosh! Yes, I uh, I saw that video actually a couple of times, and um, you know, full disclosure, uh, to me and I are pretty good friends. And we talk about stuff all the time. We talk about these things all the yeah. time. Um, I think the thing that really stuck out with me, um, and that when I hear when I hear Leah talk, and I hear people who are very connected to um, issues that um, the environmental issues, and it's really what's really interesting is many of the people that I know 
like this wasn't the this wasn't the trajectory of life like somewhere we made a left and i was like well, how how did we get here but um life was so that it 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 brought us here and i think with that journey i'm just listening to to leah and again i've read her stuff she's got a she's got a couple of books and things out um i think the thing that probably resonates with me the most is the closer you get um, to the land, the more of yourself you'll find. And I'm trying to find a different way to, to say that. Um, there's, a, there, there's a piece, if you will, a knowledge. I don't know. I know this sounds all, you know, all hemp and lava lamps, but I'm trying to find a really <laughs> cool way to say it. Um, I will say that what I what I witnessed in last year's um, agrihood was something that um, really, really, um, really, really affected me. And one of one of those things that happens, and you kind of see her on the right path. Um, some of the kids, when they put their hands in the earth, not the dirt, but the earth, the soil, and they, they, they really got their hands in that, there was something transformative about that. They started to see the idea of getting dirty or earthy um, very differently. And when I, when I had pointed out along with Rob and some other farmers that this dirt that we, you know, we come in and we want to get it off. Oh, I'm so dirty. You know, then you remind them that that same stuff that they're washed, they're wiping off and brushing off and want to get off them is the thing that feeds them, that feeds that tree, that feeds that potato, that feeds that animal, that feeds the air that we breathe and the fish that we, so, so many things when you see that interconnectivity and it's not, you know, it's not a big long equation. It's a couple of simple lines and then you get that, ah, but when that big, that, that one line of not connecting with the environment is missing, so much of who we are and who we can be and where we've come from is gone too. But when they make that connection, they see themselves and then they see themselves in connection with everybody else. I, I think for me, because I've seen that video a couple of times as well. Um, I think for me, the thing that resonates is my, so my grandmother was the child of sharecroppers in Mississippi. Um, my great grandfather on the other side had about 110 acres in Mississippi, um, that was split up between his 10 children, um, so that it couldn't be sold. Basically it was deliberate. Um, and my grandfather's 110 acres had oil on it, um, which he was not allowed to keep because he was black in the 1920s, uh, late teens, early twenties. And so I look at what would have been what would have been different had my grandfather been allowed to keep that oil what would have looking at the life that i've had and the life that others i know have had for better or for worse how would it have been different if he had been allowed to keep what he worked to buy right and then I look at my grandmother and listen to the stories I've grown up with being taught Black American history at home because it was not taught in the schools and certainly not in the schools that I grew up in. You know, I went to both private and public schools and you didn't get it in either. You got a little bit more in the public schools, but not much. And that was usually directly from the teachers who cared, right? So most of, most of my learning was from my family because they were determined to teach us. But that also means that I got the stories that my grandmother shared about growing up and being beaten for running through the white man's cotton fields and all of these other stories and how the sharecropping system actually worked and how you know they would tell them you would get a bit of the profit at the end and there was never any profit. And not only was there no profit, but they would be charged for renting the tools. You get all of this, you know, the 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 trauma that is associated with the land. And so, you know, last year I was actually at one of the Agrihood events and there was um, a beautiful uh, horse and, and, and old fashioned plow being used. And I was standing next to it and, 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 you know, Rob was like, who wants to go next? 
And I just backed up. It was a visceral reaction to being next to a old fashioned horse and plow. I had never been on in, in that scenario, but it was embedded because of the trauma to my family. And so even on my own land, there were times where it was like, I'm working hard and I'm outside and it's like, why am I out here working like a slave? And I had to stop and catch myself because that tr that healing from the trauma needed to happen. And you have to tell you, oh, it's okay, I own it, right? But what about all the people who haven't had that opportunity to heal? So there's a huge uh, trauma that needs healing is, is kind of what that video reminds me of. And I think that this movement of, of, of people of color, particularly Black Americans going back to the land and reclaiming this agricultural heritage that we had long before the transatlantic slave trade is a very powerful thing. And it's just a beautiful thing to see people re, uh, having that reclamation and that healing with the land. This kind of segues into what you were just speaking about. But um, based off of your experience and seeing firsthand the effects of um, systematic racism in your family and how it played a role in your family's like wealth in regard to having the oil on your farm, why do you think it's still important for people of color especially to connect with agriculture practices and, um, pardon my pun, but to ground themselves with the earth and um, really get dirty and... Um, with the entire field and although they've been systematically excluded from it, why do you think it's important that although we've gone through so many negative experiences, we still need to continue to be in this field? I, I think that healing is is critical. I don't I don't think it should be optional for many reasons. Um, but also looking at your food that you consume doesn't doesn't begin to it is not doesn't just affect you. It affects generations to come. Before you even get pregnant, your body is affected by the food you consume and hence your children, right? Male and feed, father or mother, your children are affected. The food that your children consume affects their education, whether or not they're, how well they're able to receive what it is that they're being taught, how well they're able to focus and behave, what career paths they then choose, what track some public school decides to put them in. All of that is greatly affected by your food system. If you're trying to teach a person to fish, you can't teach a hungry person to fish because they're going to be busy jumping in the water after the fish and they're probably going to drown before they ever learn how to throw the rod, right? So it's important that we feed people, but it's, it's also important that they learn how to fish for themselves. So I think it's critical that we go back to the land because like Renata said, the, he who controls your food controls you because that is just the most basic of, of things, your food, your water, your shelter. That is it. That is everything. So if you have no control over that, you know, looking at the disparities in different communities, if you don't have any control over that as a as a as a community, you are in trouble. We absolutely. Trouble. Absolutely. And if I can just add, I think one of the other things is um, I think it's important to be able to change the narrative. I think the narrative has been skewed just one way and it's been skewed in a particular way that <clears throat> is oppressive, is binding and is a lie. Um, the, the three groups that come to mind that are African-Americans, Latinos and indigenous people, these three groups have the most contentious, confusing um, and painful histories in and on this land. And I think what's important is if we are gonna go forward, I mean, you hear words like, you know, Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And you hear words like reparation and you hear all of this stuff flying around and almost ad nauseum. But before you get caught up in how this, you know, popular nomenclature uh, is flying around, I think you need to look at the, the crux of the issue. And if we don't correct some of this, and it's painful, especially people who don't feel they have a hand in it. Um, <clears throat> we've all gleaned something from the wrongs that have been done in the past. No matter what side of this you are, we've all inherited something. Um, we need to go on 
in a different way. And to, to Mia's point, the idea of, of healing is not something, you know, out here in the, in the, in the ether somewhere. Um, we hear about people and trauma constantly. The, the trauma of the past is so weighty and the issues that we drag with us to the future because we refuse to deal with them is bearing down on us. And I honestly think that if we are going to address so many of these issues, like we were just you know, talking about food, you can turn on any TV or infomercial at 1 a.m. and see some poor child starving in some developing country. And all it is is they want food and we have so much. We have so much and we think nothing of wasting it. We think nothing of, of, of um, not even considering the people who produce it, people who are who work at migrant workers or sharecroppers even now. We don't think about what it takes to bring our food here. We also don't think of those. What did we learn, um, Sarah? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Gar said 12 companies who can who who control the food system worldwide, just 12, and the 20 items that we tend to eat all the time. Somebody is controlling us. Somebody is, is writing our destiny for us. And like we point out in the, in the Outdoor Equity Alliance is it's always the people who are historically on the periphery that suffer the most from things like this. So those of us who have and can should. Yeah. And also that just know that there are people who are doing this healing work. There are people connected to the Outdoor Equity work Alliance who are actually working on this kind. This isn't, you know, like you said, this is not a pie in the sky passing thought. There are people who are on the ground doing the work to help people heal the trauma that's associated with the land in order to help get them outdoors and really enjoy the earth as they should. Yeah. So it's a lot of people on the ground doing the work already. It's good. Dr. Teresa, I saw you've had your hand up. Yes, I, well, I just wanted to, to add, and I wanted to thank um, um, both Renata and Tomia for being here. I, I work with both of them. Um, I've been invited into that community of gardeners, even though my, my best plant is weeds. I grow them very well. <laughs> so I'm gonna be trained on pulling the weeds and helping to, to actually grow edibles. I mean, some of those weeds are probably edible, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, just reclaiming, when I look at getting my hands back into the earth and, and, and growing, um, I feel like I'm going back to a legacy that, that all of my grandparents and my aunts and everyone, everyone had a little garden. I come from a little black town in Florida. Um, we grew our own food. We had, you know, the butcher up the street where we got our meats that were raised by someone who took care of the animals well. Um, we respected, you know, we, we had all of that. We had our own bakers. We had all those folks in our town. I never looked at the land as trauma, I guess. We ate seasonally, we ate well, um, you know, and, and that was just part of our legacy. We grew, and, and we also had people that picked and basically worked for slave labor in the groves, you know, cause that's what Florida was. And we had people that farmed and did it out of work necessity and were, were, were you know, basically um, took taken advantage of in that regard, but we also had our own. And people took those when, in the Great Migration all over the Midwest and everything. Everybody always had their own gardens, even when they went to the cities. And now, you know, when I go to those cities and I see kids eating out of this store, corner store and the vegetable is, you know, uh, you know, what kind of juice do you want, red or purple? You know, it's not real juice. And you can't get a real piece of produce. Or, you know, I see what kids are eating now versus we never had much but we had fresh vegetables and meats and we respected and we didn't eat a lot of meat because you didn't have access to a lot of meat, um, but everything you ate was healthy and you were outside and you were, you know, going to tend your grandmother's chickens or going to get the eggs or going up the street to see the butcher or picking the fresh fruit when it was ready and then making preserves. That is something I think we've lost as a people. And I want to be able to bring that back to my family. So I appreciate the work that we're doing and that we're bringing that to these young people. That, that are here in this space. So thank you for that. Thanks, Dr. Chitri. So I, I was, um, we had a lot more questions than we've had time to get to this evening, but I wanted to take some time and, and to ask some questions of Sarah and Xavier. Um, you've been 
doing such a good job at asking questions and guiding the conversation. So I just wanted to hear some reflections from you. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take the floor. Um, I can definitely like, I, I can relate to a lot of like what you're saying because my name is Xavier Fields and Xavier means the new house and Fields means Fields. So like, it's, it's been like obtaining that trauma, like a house slave and a field slave in the same name. Like I, I got that. Like I, I heard that from a lot of people. It was like, I'd be like, Hey guys, my name means the new house. Cause like, it wasn't that cool, but you know, I thought it would, you know, I thought it would get some smiles, but like, that's always what I got from it. So I was always really scared. I hated being dirty. I resonated with that. I hated touching dirt. I didn't like getting the dirt on my hands because I have to go wash it off. But like, I always wanted to get into farming and stuff, but I just never had the confidence to do it. Then one day I was just like, you know, why not? And it was really fulfilling. It was really fun. And that's just why I do it. Like I just genuinely, it's something I can actually enjoy doing. You know, I can just go outside. You know, I want to plant sunflowers today. I did it because I, you know, it was fun, makes me happy. And like the fact that I enjoy it, you know, it doesn't really, it makes all that other stuff like second, second now, like it's fun. I don't care if my name is literally fields. That makes it even better. In fact, because then when I get a farm, nice little sign fields, fields right there, everyone will get lost. You won't be able to find it. All right. I had a different upbringing than Xavier when it came to my interest in agriculture. My Both of my grandparents on both sides were farmers, but from the Caribbean. So um, when they did immigrate to America, they would always have a little farm. I remember my grandfather lived in Trenton and would use the little edges between the concrete and the dirt to plant tomatoes. And I remember I always help them um, either pick them or start planting them. And um, the older I got, the more I learned about racism and systematic racism, especially. And I think that sparked my interest in um, agriculture, especially surrounding food, since I think it's a very important issue to realize that if given the right tools, we can make a big difference. And also, I would really I'm very interested in figuring out a way to like in Tamia's farm, continue farming using no pesticides, going the more organic route, because as Renat has stated multiple times, who controls the food controls us. And I think if especially Black people can control the food that are being fed to them, they can make a difference in their own health. And systematically um, and statistically, it's been shown that Black people suffer from heart issues and like things like that because the food they have access to is, uh, it tends to be processed and unhealthy. But if we make these steps and make it aware that we can make a change, then a difference can be made. And I really value that. So well, I wanted to thank everybody. We're, we're about out of time. I don't know if there are any burning questions in the audience before we wrap up for the evening. Um, this conversation could could go on much longer. It's so rich. So um, just wanted to give pause for a moment to see if anybody had questions or last comments. Renata. Oh, I just wanted to put a plug in for my girl, Tamia. Um, <laughs> you guys should make it a point to get over to Wildflower Farm. Uh, and I, I think the uh, website is wildflowerfarmnj.com. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you should definitely check it out. She does farm tours. You can get your eggs there. You can get your chickens there. You can get your turkeys there. Support local farm. And I know you see a lot of those things. I'm not playing with y'all. I don't want to see you in the market. You don't need <laughs> you don't need to go to the market as much as you go to the market. Um, <laughs> but please support a lot of these great farmers out here. Um, she does great classes. Um on growing garlic, growing other things, how to get started, homesteading. 
And um, I really want to support. I really want to support. And I want to see our community get behind Tamia and the other farmers. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I've posted Tamia's website in the in the chat, and I hope everyone has the opportunity to visit and see what Tamia is what doing. Is good to see you making a move. Yeah, hold up on that. Just chill. <laughs> well, I don't mean out of here, out of here. I just mean I'm just 21. I got I got lots of years left. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're gonna we're gonna just 29. move over as we go. That's what we're gonna, 21 we're gonna times move over. two, probably, but three. And I'm gonna add, <laughs> I'm gonna add to the love fest and say I'm sending it out to Carolyn McGrath because she is an amazing teacher. And Absolutely. it's because of her that these, in part because of her, that these students are given these opportunities. And, and I, it's so impressive and inspiring and moving, actually. So thanks for all, all of what you do. Great. Well, I'll, I'll send the back at you all <laughs> for coming out this evening. I, so appreciate this conversation. And I also appreciate the opportunity for people to um, to go along with, with, you know, things that I think, oh, this is going to be a great conversation, pulling people together and for everybody's willingness to just come and, and make space for this, because this is so important to me and it's important to our community. And um, so thank you all. And right. come to come to our eco trivia night on Thursday um, because we're going to be raising some money for the Outdoor Equity Alliance. Yes, tell all your friends. Yes, you can sign up on the Green Week website. Have a good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.